Welcome to Gaia Community. We are an Earth-based pagan Unitarian Universalist congregation meeting here online every Sunday around about four o'clock. This week, our ritual is designed to introduce us to the first four of 12 candidates for our patron of the year process. Uh, each year, Gaia Community chooses a deity or power to work with in the coming year. Uh, we make that decision usually in July. Uh, for those of you who have been with us for a while, you know we used to do a big theatrical fundraiser to make this happen. Uh, very difficult to do that in the age of all online uh, COVID safe rituals. So we are uh, working a new process this year. You're going to, over the next three weeks, hear a little bit from folks who are representing 12 powers that we nominated in a forum a couple of months ago. And then at the end of this process, we'll hold a vote and we will choose our patron of the year that way. So this week, uh, we will hear from folks who are representing Ostara, Ianus, Ushas, and Inanna. Next week, we'll hear from the next four candidates and the week after that, the final four. So today, I am your host, and the ritualists representing these deities and powers are Devon, speaking for Astara, Matt, speaking for Ianos, David, speaking for Ushas, and Jamie, speaking for Inanna. So we'll hear a little bit from each of them in turn. I want to begin today by lighting a chalice. And today our chalice lighting comes from Dr. Klur Mukim from the Unitarian Union of Northeast India. This is the UUA's global chalice lighting for the month of May, and it's very lovely. So I thought I would share it with you. And it is divine source of creation and all enlightenment. May this chalice be lighted in your wonderful vastness to help us stay grounded in eternal light and righteousness. We are grateful for everything within us and around us that has shaped our individual lives and our life as a spiritual community. May our souls find purpose, meaning, and peace as we evolve in our thought, our work, and our journey here, now, and beyond. Let's it be. In our work today, we will take a journey to a liminal space that we imagine to be the temple of all the powers. But before we do that, Let's take a moment to prepare ourselves for the journey, for the work. I'm gonna share my screen here and show you some questions to think about. So as we begin our work today, take a deep breath. Breathe in, hold on to that air, and then breathe out slowly, regularly. Take a moment to ground yourself in the here and now, to ground yourself in your own body, your own spirit, your own intentions. As you breathe, as you center yourself, you might ask yourself, how do I feel today? What values matter to me? 
what am I seeking in matters of spiritual kinship? What needs do I seek to have fulfilled by this community? And which values and works put forward by the powers do I think will best help Gaia community become a place that will serve those needs? Take a moment to center yourself, to breathe, to consider. as we prepare ourselves for the work. And be grounded, centered, present with us today. Blessed be. As you consider all of these things, please know that your needs are valued. And this selection process has as its goal the meeting of the most spiritual needs of the most members. Gaia Community's patron process does not require you or anyone to adopt a personal patron relationship or any sort of relationship with any of the powers introduced or selected. We're making a choice for the group. We're making a choice for the community. As with all of our rights, you are invited to participate at the level you're comfortable with. You will have opportunities today to interact with four different powers who may ask very different things of you. Please feel free to participate in that as you see fit. Now, I invite you to settle yourself into a comfortable position for our journey. to let your eyes be open or closed, whichever lets you enter into your own mind, enter into that other world of imagination and visualization. Let your journey begin wherever you are. Let your journey begin in your own space. Today, you will visit the temple of all powers. The journey is an inner one. It takes place here in your mind. It will take you to a place beyond reality, but all the same, the travel is familiar. You move from where you currently rest, finding yourself outside your home, wherever you are, and you begin your journey the way you begin any other journey, perhaps in a car, perhaps you've walked to the bus stop, summoned a car or drive, ride in a friend's vehicle. However you travel, the journey is simple. As you move, you notice the world around you seems to know of your purpose today. And the journey is made easy. Anyone you encounter seems more helpful, more pleasant. There are few obstacles to your movement today. You move freely, easily, simply, quickly beyond your neighborhood, beyond the city where you are, out, out into the surrounding countryside. And as you move, you notice how intention guides you. The land around you begins to change. Your road may shift from pavement to old stones. Your vehicle, if any, 
drops you off at the bottom of a hill. You see a clear and easy path up that hill, a moving walkway, smooth paving stones, easy stairs. However you need to move up that hill, you are able to. The trip passes easily. And at the top of the hill is a huge round temple. As you look, you may see it shift, flicker, change. As you look at it from different angles, shift, flicker, switch from culture to culture, era to era. You approach the temple and as you enter, you see a dizzying array of altars, temple spaces, places dedicated to deities, to powers from every time and every place. Some made of stone, some of wood, some of metal or brick, some carved from great trees, some the dark blankless blankness of a starless night. You let your intention guide you down one hall to one corner where you will meet the attendance of four temples in particular. You have come to hear today from Ostara, from Ianus, from Ushas, from Inanna. As you approach, the attendants, the priests, the workers of the temple make preparations to invoke the presence of their power, to prepare those who hear for sacred work. I praise Easter, goddess of the dawn. Rising mighty in the east, you bless us. I praise Easter, goddess of the fertile fields, with victory and fruitful luck, you nourish us. I praise Easter, goddess of new beginnings, with strength and resilience, you fortify us. Shine your light upon us, O oh, holy goddess. Make your words and deeds mighty, make our words and deeds mighty in your eyes. Replenish us daily with your light. We hail you, gracious goddess of the dawn. Morning maiden, come again. We hail you, Easter, with whom spring itself is named. Please. May our endeavors be fruitful. Hail. As such, we know there are many towns and hills spread across England, Germany, Norden, and other cultural and linguistically tied areas with Easter or a star in them. For the Anglo-Saxons, they named their days for Suna, for Mani, for Tyr, for Woden, for Thor, for the twins Freya and Frey. But they named a whole month for Easter, Our Lady of the Spring. She was so worshipped in her time that the church beyond the Rhine and north of the Channel had to use her name for their own God's death and rebirth. And friends, let me tell you about what we definitively know of her myths and stories a thousand years later. That's it. We know definitively nothing. We know the rabbits, hares, bunnies, were commonly just showing back up when her rites were celebrated. We know that just as the first bushel was given 
to harvest deities, and others got the first sip of wine, that she would get the first eggs, and those would get decorated, as locally they were able to be done. We know that she gave her blessings to the first social events of the season after a long and isolated winter, something we can all empathize with. So with this in mind, I ask you all to take a few slow, deep breaths. And in your mind's eye, take yourself back to some place that when you were young was comfortable, was friendly, was joyful. Some place where you felt invigorated and new. Remember those things that you saw there, that you felt there. that you heard and tasted. Remember in this place how you were young. And see in your mind's eye a box, a chest, something latched and move over to it and know that in this thing is something that the world has caused you to forget that you wish to remember something that you wish to reconnect with Open it and feel it in your hand. See it in your mind's eye. Feel the weight. Hear the noise that it makes. And if this thing still exists, or has been destroyed by whatever means. Know that in your heart, you can bring it with you and use it as a touchstone to find that youthful joy when you need it. I give you a few minutes with this as you need. My Lady of the Dawn asks, however, that you honor the oral culture and not write down what you see. That if it is truly important, you remember it. That you encode it in some fashion into your mind's eye.
And as you are ready, take the bowl of water and feel the dew of the dawn upon your face. May you bring you here and ready shortly to go to the next temple. My final ask for Ostar likes to keep it simple is that as patron in this time of reopening, of dawning hope, that we keep it joyful and simple and that we find those stories and useful artifacts that we or our forebears have erased and bring them to light or if need be, recreate them. Hail. We bid farewell to the temple of Astara and turn, turn, move and turn again to find ourselves face to face with the temple of Ionis. And welcome to the temple niche of Janus, first of the Roman gods, father of all Numenae, and the only god we know of, exclusive to Rome with no Greek or other non-Roman counterpart. Janus is the guardian of doors, the patron of beginnings, the overseer of transitions, and the representative of duality. With the now iconic look of faces looking in two directions, Janus had power and relationship over nearly everything expressed as a pair, forward and behind, past and future, here and there, and kind and unkind, to name only a very few. Examining a problem from multiple directions and considering what lies ahead just as thoroughly as we would what has come before is a contemplation worthy of Janus and the core of the work that I bring you today. Because the religion of Rome was built on a number of extremely specific forms, I have done a good chunk of the work of creating a sacred space in advance so that we have time to truly do this work, contemplating the nature of doorways and transitions. Before we enter the prepared altar space, take a moment to focus yourself and repeat after me in Latin, English, or both, however you feel most comfortable. Purgamentem purify my mind. With your arms relaxed, purga corpus, purify my body. Purga animum, purify my heart. Taking a moment to bring all the aspects of yourself in focus fully, become present and affirm, ita est, it is so. If you have not already done so, though many of you have, take this moment to cover your head as we shift to our temple space. There we are. A virtual background didn't want to leave. We call now to the patron of this small rite, Janus Pater, 
teoc vinum omovendo bones preces, precor utis sies volens propitius ilis quiritibus te laudatis, quo ius re ergo hoc sacrificium offero. Father Janus, with good prayers, I offer to you this wine. May it be your will to look with favor upon these folk who seek to honor you, for which purpose I make this offering. Salvete Janus! By way of introduction to our work, I want to share with you a thought drawn from the novel The Ten Thousand Doors of January, a novel which presupposes that the areas we tend to call thin places exist as crossing points between different realities called doors. For convenience, though, many of them don't look like what we would call a door. And while perhaps less drastic, in the Roman convention, it was considered an important part of any day to make a first sacrifice to Janus as part of one's acknowledgement of the household spirits and gods of the family in order that you might cross safely out of the home and safely return again. What I invite you to do today as I read this to you is consider the precipice we stand on. The world is preparing to shift. What has challenged us and kept us separated this past year is beginning to change. As those changes begin, we have an opportunity to examine the doors ahead of us and decide what sort of world we wish to cross into and what parts of the world we used to know we wish to bring through the door with us. Let us begin with the first conceit of this work. Doors are portals between one world and another, which exist only in places of particular and indefinable resonance. By indefinable resonance, I refer to the space between worlds, that vast blackness waiting on the threshold of every door, which is hideously dangerous to pass through. It is as though the borders of oneself grow dissolute with nothing pressing against them, and your very essence threatens to spill away into the void. Literature and myth are rife with tales of those who have entered the void and failed to emerge on the other side. It seems therefore likely that doors themselves were originally constructed in places where this blackness is at its thinnest and least deadly convergence points, natural crossroads. And what is the nature of these other worlds? As we have discovered in previous chapters, they are infinitely varied and ever-changing, and often fail to comply with the conventions of our present world, which we are arrogant enough to call the physical laws of the universe. There are places where man, men and women are winged and red-skinned, and places where there is no such thing as man and woman, but only persons somewhere in between. There are worlds where the continents are carried on the back of vast turtles swimming through freshwater oceans, where snakes speak riddles, where the lines between the dead and living are blurred to insignificance. I have seen villages where fire itself had been tamed and followed at men's heels like an obedient hound and cities with glass spires so high they gathered clouds around their spiral points. If you are wondering why other worlds seem so brimful of magic compared to your own dreary earth, consider how magical this world seems from another perspective. To a world of sea people, your ability to breathe air is stunning. 
to a world of spear throwers. Your machines are demons harnessed to work tirelessly in your service. To a world of glaciers and clouds, summer itself is a miracle. One of the elements you see of the altar before you is a white space between a blue pillar and a red pillar. Blue for the infinite space that doors help us to pass through, red for the hearth fire of Vesta and the space between our portal, our crossroads of the worlds. And when charging this element of the altar, part of the Roman liturgy is stand we here as a doorway, acknowledging our individual part in the crossing of worlds. For it is in our hearts that we make this journey. And if we believe that the magic we work is real, it is our ability to bring our will and intention forward to create reality where we are that shapes reality where we are. When we work together as a people, what we build together allows us to become a pillar that holds up a doorway to cross into new worlds. So I invite you as you think about what sort of door you would like to open and what sort of world lies on the other side to take up your writing instrument and paper or open a word processor on another screen and reflect on some images of different types of doorways that I will show you with some relaxing, thoughtful music. Where might these doors lead? Is it somewhere you wish to go? What is on the other side? And who is waiting for you there?
as you collect your last few thoughts, I'm going to make one more offering to Ianus to ask forgiveness for any aspect of this work that may not have met the high standard of expectation for Roman worship. Janus Pater, gods and goddesses, holy ancestors and spirits of this place, if anything that we have done here has offended you, if anything we have done here has been incomplete, if anything we have done here has not been in the proper manner, accept this offering of unmixed wine and incense. And as I finish making the offering, travelers, I bid you a safe transition to the next temple niche that you visit today. And we turn from Janus, dual-natured Lord of Doors, and follow a winding path. Until we reach the bright altar of Ushas. Welcome. I'll let you get settled. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about Ushas, who comes to us from the ancient Vedic tradition. Uh, the Vedic people, or the people who wrote the Vedas, I guess we could say, uh, we don't have a proper name for them, but they originate from the Indo-Aryan migration. So where uh, Iran is now, people spread from there across many directions and eventually became most of what we now call the Indo-European people who make up most of Europe and Asia, frankly. And the Indo-Aryans came down into the north part of where India is now, and were a pastoral nomadic people. They kept cattle and horses and those sorts of animals, but they didn't settle for much longer. And this is, we're probably talking about 2000 to 1500 years BCE. And so when they wrote, when they composed hymns and poems to their gods, they transmitted them orally, and they did so for approximately a thousand years before anyone started writing them down. What they did, though, was uh, they had a very complicated system of memorization techniques that would allow them to transmit these from teacher to student. They would do things like say the passage all the way through. And then they would say it again, but you say every other word and then fill back in the blanks. Or you would do the first word and the last word and the second word and the second to last word. And they would learn these passages in several different ways so that there is a very small chance of corruption in the uh, translation. And so what we ended up with from these people when, they, when it was written down was called the Rig Veda, or the Rig Vedas. And this is one of the oldest religious texts in the world. And it predates several religions that exist now, although Vedic religion is not currently practiced in any uh, cultural sense. But it led to Hinduism, uh, certain forms of Buddhism, especially the more mystical Buddhist uh, branches, some of which ended up in Japan, and Jainism all branch out from this. But I want to talk to you about the Vedics, and specifically I want to talk to you about Ushas. Ushas is the most important goddess for the Vedics. She is not quite as important to them as Agni and Soma, and uh, forgive me, uh, Indra. But after them, she is the next most prominent deity in the Rig Veda. 
she had approximately 40 hymns, has, I should say, because we have those hymns. I can't read Sanskrit, so I'm not going to share them with you. Um, but she has about 40 hymns in there, and they all describe her very eloquently as the dawn. In Vedic uh, mythology, Vedic cosmology, these deities are not over a concept. Like we might think of uh, some other deities are, they're the god of writing, or they're the, they're the god of uh, messengers, or they're the god, goddess of childbirth. They are the concept themselves. So Agni is both the deity and the fire itself. Uh, so Ushas is the dawn. And as the dawn, she has a prominent role in Vedic mythology because she orders time. She marks that passage from dark, chaotic night, as Matt alluded to, to the day when people can move around safely. She marks out the day because she is the start of the day. And so she was also viewed as a reminder of mortality, but also a agent of long life, one who could be asked for long life because she was the one who could measure time out. Um, she's always described as very beautiful. Uh, often she rides a chariot pulled by red cows and she's bedecked in jewelry and her robes represent all of the colors of dawn. So you can think of dawn as being uh, this dancing woman whose robes change as she moves and steadily brighten and become more and more elaborate. Uh, she has a, in the way they're written down, she has a relationship with the sun, uh, who is often uh, Surya or Savitri. And, but it's a, it's a chasing relationship. It's not, it's not the sort of relationship that they consummate because she's always running ahead of him. And so she is in some ways a maid goddess, a, a, I don't want to say virgin goddess, but she is not tied to him. She is separate from him. And she is there as a, a beneficent force. She is out there. She radiates life. She radiates uh, health and wealth and prosperity. And again, this idea of chasing the nightmares away. Bad dreams end when dawn comes is one of part of one of the hymns. Um, the, the cold gets less with daylight. And um, she was her, herself described as uh, a mother to the people or a, a mother in the sense that a cow is a mother to the people. She provided for the people in that uh, giving of herself way. And so evil spirits who live in the dark fear her. They, they flee uh, when dawn comes, and dawn comes every day. Uh, so I invite you to close your eyes or think about Ushas as the bringer of prosperity in whatever sense that you are contemplating it. This means different things to different people. And so, like I said, Ushas brings wealth or health, happiness, a free, free freeness, that's not a word, freedom from bad dreams. She propitiates the chaos of the world. She is seen as upholding and emitting uh, cosmic order, Marita. So much like when we work with uh, Toth in the Egyptian society, we had the concept there of the right order of things, this in Vedic religion as well. And so 
if you close your eyes and let the light hit your eyes from your room, your monitor, the sun, even though it is the middle of the afternoon, I want you to contemplate dawn hitting your eyelids, chasing away bad thoughts, bad dreams, negative memories. Usha springs joy and good things, prosperity. Ushas radiates these things, free for everyone. And Ushas asks that we uphold that order in the ways that we work in the world, that we contribute to the good functioning of our society, that we contribute to the ability for people to be free of negative experiences, that they have the ability to prosper, that we help people to experience the wealth and abundance that is available to them when they are not weighed down by these demons that plague them. Ushas comes into the world each morning as a promise, as a fulfillment of a promise, that things will get better. The darkness never lasts forever. Dawn will come, a new day, a new chance, a new beginning, a chance to begin again and do what it is that you were meant to do that day. So I want to share with you a brief ritual. Uh, I recorded it earlier because burning a fire altar inside my house is a bit uh, beyond what I'm willing to put up with in my brand new house that I still have 14 and 10 twelfths of a uh, years of mortgage to pay off on. Because the Vedic people were nomadic, they had to take their altars with them. And so each time they needed to use one, they would construct it and then deconstruct it immediately afterward. Here I'm constructing a basic fire altar, which is still used in that part of the world today in parts of Hinduism. The shape of it is square, representing order, but you'll notice that the bricks that make up the altar are arranged differently on each layer so that while there's a pattern, there's also strength from the difference between them. Then I place the offering bowl and kindle a fire above it. The bowl of clear water is for anything that would not burn in this ritual, similar to the well that you'll sometimes see in other ADF ritual. Then I light incense to honor Agni, the eternal fire, and in this case to consecrate the space. Then we kindle the fire. The blocks that are being burned have the word Ushas written on them so that in the ash and in the transformation, the messages know where to go.
then I offer this prayer from Reverend Janavende of ADF. O daughter of the sky, dancing in the light, arising from darkness, I stand entranced by your beauty, your radiant form laying across my mind just as it drapes across the sky. Rosy gold droplets stream down your freshly bathed limbs, bright and beautiful maid, as you waken the pious spirits to sing your hymns, rekindling my heart just as you rekindle Agni each new day, burning hot and strong in me, just as you do on the earth. I court you, O brilliant maiden, as you shower me with your riches, singing praises with my voice, just as the sky itself sings colors for you. Breath and life of all, awaken all to motion as you dance across the rim of the world, goddess of the ever-rising sun, glowing in radiant splendor. Be never far from my thoughts, be never far from me, be never far from the community. Ushas, bright greetings of the day. So I thank you for taking time to learn about Ushas of the Vedic religion, and I invite you to consider her as a patron for the coming year. Bright blessings to all of you. And we turn away from the altar of the Maiden of Dawn, moving onward to the last temple we will visit today, to hear from the temple of Inanna. In preparation for your time with Inanna today, you've composed a meal of bread, figs, beef, and beer. You carry this meal with you. As you approach the niche in the temple for Inanna, you notice a post made of rings and an eight-pointed star, symbols of Inanna. Step closer. There is a small pool of water. Dip your bare feet in the pool. A voice speaks. May you be blessed by Ningal and purified by the power of earth. May you be blessed by Enki and purified by the power of water. May you be blessed by Enlil and purified by the power of air. As you step away from the pool, you see a fire burning with a large brazier. Hold your hands over the flame. The voice speaks again. May you be blessed by Utu and purified by the power of fire. You light incense on a small shelf near a, near the, near a statue of Inanna, the scent surrounding you. A soft light shines on the statue of Inanna in her niche and you call out to her. Inanna, goddess of love, sex, and beauty, grace us with your presence here in the temple. Inanna, goddess of war, justice, and political power, strengthen us with your presence here in the temple. Inanna, you stole the May from Enki, god of wisdom, to bring the blueprints of civilization to your favorite city of Uruk. Inanna, you descended to the underworld and conf confronted your sister Erishkigal, were stripped of your powers, were made a corpse, but still returned. Inanna, queen of heaven and earth, Join us here in the temple and help us to know you better. You lay your offering of a meal at the foot of the statue, saying, Inanna, accept this offering of a meal of bread, beef, figs, and beer. Please consume it and speak to us of how you could inspire our community in the coming year.
the statue begins to glow and comes to life. The goddess before you wears the shigura, the crown of the plain on her head, dark locks of hair across her forehead. She wears small lapis beads around her neck, a gold ring over her wrist and a royal robe wrapped around her body. She carries a lapis measuring rod and line in her hand. She steps forward. You seek audience with me that you may know me better. You wish to know if I would be a good patron of your community and what I would expect of you in return. I am a powerful goddess. You know I stole the May from Enki, but I also supplanted on the God of the sky from his own temple. I suffer not those who insult me or do me harm. When I was assaulted in my sleep, my vengeance was swift. But I also lend my power to those who need protection. I can inspire you in cultivating a passion for life. I would encourage you to seek justice and to work for a better world for all people. I embrace those who may not fit into traditional roles and would expect you to do the same. I go to great lengths for those in my perfection. I even descended to the underworld and confronted my sister Erishkegal. My powers were taken from me and when I appeared for, before her, she had me killed and my corpse hung from the wall. My faithful servant pled with the other gods until Anki agreed to send help that I might return. I urge you to explore your own powers and how it would feel to be stripped of them. In this way, you can know the kind of personal work I would expect of you should I become your patron. What are your seven may? the seven powers you carry with you when you are in need. Each of us has those things we consider important to whom we are. Perhaps our schooling, our diplomas and degrees. Perhaps our special talents. Perhaps our family background or ethnic heritage. Perhaps the job we hold or the relationships we have with people. Perhaps our monetary wealth or our physical beauty or strength. What gives you your power? Take a moment to write these things down in your journal and there will be relaxing music played behind you so you can focus on the work.
how would you feel should you be stripped of these powers? Would you still be strong? Would you still be able to face challenges ahead of you? I'd like you to reflect on that. Take some time, write in your journal about that. Think about how you would feel in that situation, similar to the situation that Inanna faced. Your work does you credit. 
should you choose me, we will work more with your seven May, especially when we will also work for so, towards social justice, especially for women, sex workers, and the LGBTQIA community. Make your decision wisely. She steps back into her niche, and once again you face a statue. You bid well. You bid farewell to Inanna, thanking her for her presence, asking that she come again when requested. We give thanks to Inanna for her presence here today. Thank you for your strength and grace. We pray that you will return when we ask to spend time with you on another day. Hail and well met, Inanna. We turn away from this last temple, the temple of mighty Inanna. Leaving this temple of all powers with thanks and appreciation for Inanna, for Ushas, for Ianus, and for Astara. And we take just a moment to return from this place of imagination, this place of visualization, back to our own space, our own time, here today, in our own houses, where many things are happening. Next week, we'll return again to the Temple of All Powers, and we will hear from folks speaking on behalf of the mighty dead of Odumbla, the great primordial cow, and uh, Hestia, the keeper of the, the hearth fire in Greek culture. We will also hear someone speak on behalf of the possibility of having no patron at all, and what opportunities that might create for us. So I thank all of the ritualists today who prepared introductions to their powers. Thank you. And ask folks to take a moment uh, to make any announcements that we have to share. What's coming up in the next week? Joys and Concerns continues on Thursday at 8 here <laughs> on Zoom. On Tuesday evening at 7 p.m., uh, the UUA Candidate Forum will be happening on Zoom, on their Zoom channel. There is a link to it on the website and on our Facebook, and if you cannot find it, let me know. Uh, we are going to try to get together on Discord and discuss what we see because this is a contested election for once with the EUA, which has not happened in a number of years. Uh, and then for those of you who are ritualists, ritual teams will meet on Saturday. Uh, Saturdays are the 10 a.m. meeting. To be clear, if you show up at 7 p.m., you will be much, much too late and hopefully by yourself. I've just posted many links in the chat. Uh, the first is to our website, GaiaCommunity.org, where you can find many ways to support us and the work we do. The second is to Harvesters, our local Kansas City uh, food network, which needs your help now, uh, as always. Uh, here in Kansas City, school is, has just ended in at least some parts of our many districts and uh, kids are coming. Kids who were able to take advantage of any kind of free lunch or reduced lunch program um, going back to school in person are now losing that support. So please, if you can kick in a few bucks for harvesters, or if you're not in the Kansas City area, to whoever it is that helps feed hungry folks in your area, everybody could use it. Uh, the final link I have thrown in the chat is a link to Gaia Community's Pledge Drive form. Our pledge drive is still technically ongoing for another uh, couple days, I think, Matt. And um, 
those, those of you who are members will see uh, final budget numbers for the coming year uh, real soon now. So thank you all for being here today. Uh, Jamie says in the chat, uh, if you have made an offering for Inanna in the Sumerian tradition, offerings of food are consumed, offerings of drink are poured onto the ground or down the drain if your access to the ground is limited. So if you have made offerings during that portion of our ritual, please take care of them appropriately. Thank you, Jamie. All right. Does anyone else have anything to announce or share? Hearing none, um, let us say our usual closing words together. And Susie reminds everyone, when you're done, don't forget to blow out your candles. So uh, I am going to start us off in the short form of our closing words today. Please feel free to repeat them after me. Uh, you can do it on mute if you don't want anyone to hear you, or uh, take yourself off mute and make a glorious noise. <laughs> and mess of Zoom sound with us. That's getting better. For some time. It is getting better. Uh, <laughs> our circle is open, open but unbroken. And broken. Our circle is our open, but unbroken. Open, but unbroken. unbroken. May the peace of the goddess go in our hearts. May, May the, the peace, peace of the goddess, of the goddess go, go in our hearts. Our hearts. And the dance of the god enliven our days. And, and the, the dance, dance of, of the gods in our, our days. days. And may we care for the earth and each other. And may, and may we, we care, may we care the for the earth, earth and, and, each each other. Other. and each other. Because our lives depend on it. Because, because our, our lives, lives depend on it. on it. All right, let's try to do this part together and make even more of a joyful noise. Merry meet, meet, and merry part, and merry meet again. Woo! Thank you, everyone.